Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for uh, thank you for coming. I was uh, I was remembering when I used to go and see Nina Simone. I've just seen her a couple of times in in concert, and she could just she would come onto stage and just stare everybody into silence with the force <laughs> of her presence. I don't have that force, so I have to tap rather feebly on a microphone. But uh, thank you for your attention and and for attending this panel, which is. Um, which is exciting. Um, I should introduce myself. I'm Tabitha Jackson, the director of the documentary film program at the Sundance Institute. Thank you. You may notice that that round of applause was started by the chair of our board, Pat Mitchell. <laughs> Ever supportive. Thank you, Pat. <laughs> um, and our, the, the relation between uh, the Sundance Institute and the Skull Foundation uh, is embodied by a partnership called the Stories of Change Partnership. And it involves putting uh, the best of our independent filmmakers in the same space as the best of Skull's social entrepreneurs and seeing what happens. And actually, it's a rather beautiful congress. And we've had, some, we've had nine films come out of the partnerships uh, some incredible discussions and some really valuable ongoing relationships. And in a way, this, this panel represents what happens when you put filmmakers and social entrepreneurs in a room. And what you may notice by the end of the panel is that although they do different work, they do have some things in common. Um, independence of spirit and thought and action is one of them, which is very important to Sundance and, and very important to their work. Uh, they're driven by and fueled by a cocktail, often, of outrage and belief, and also fueled by cocktails. <laughs> <laughs> they are bloody-minded, and the, the flies on the wall and the flies in the ointment <laughs> seem to have a very similar path together. But what they also have in common is a sense of... Um, wanting to move people and wanting to move people to act and to somehow effect change. And the, the title of this panel is, is The Story of Change, Revolution Begins in the Imagination. And so that is the point of this panel. That's what's going to be explored today. Um, and it's going to be done through the masterful, mistressful <laughs> aegis of Jess Search, and when you get Jess Search to moderate your panel, it's like having, I don't know, Daniel Barenboim playing at your wedding. You just know people are going to leave happy. Um, so I should stop No talking. pressure then. No pressure at all, Jess, no. So to the woman who puts Jess in gesticulate <laughs> and <laughs> search into searching questions, <laughs> Jess Search. <laughs> She actually normally calls me jesticle. <laughs> <laughs> um, what a fantastic panel I've got. The first thing I want to say about this panel, and I know, I know the work of Global Witness, but I'm just meeting uh, Charmian. I know Dawn very well and Pam very well from our work in film together. And Khan and I have been hanging a bit. But what an extraordinary uh, group of people I bring to you. Um, I'm thrilled to be in this discussion. First thing to say is I'm a big fan of your work to you guys. And here's an I'm a big fan of your work sticker to prove it. <laughs> I'm a big fan of your work. I'm a big fan of your work. I'm a big fan of your work. <laughs> so Tabitha and I hoped that this session could be both philosophical and practical, because these people are both thinkers and very much doers. But we are in Oxford, and this is a place of, uh, of thought and study. I brought my pile of books with me, which I drew on in thinking about their work in this session. I'm going to be peppering the session with quotes from these books. I'm going to start first with a slide of the wonderful man who taught me philosophy when I studied here a very long time ago. Um, this is Jonathan Glover, who's a moral philosopher, who was a very populist moral philosopher of his day. And what I loved about Jonathan was that he, 
he didn't just sit in his study, although it does look like he lives there, um, <laughs> but he doesn't just stick in his, in his study because he was very interested in how he could affect governments and policy. And he um, did a lot of work around reproductive health and uh, abortion rights and these kinds of things. So he inspired me to think about other thinkers. And I'm going to start with a quote because it strikes me that to do the work that these people do, these flies, our marvelous flies, to do their work, um, they need to combine an extraordinary optimism that actually there is a way through, there is a path through, but also a realism about the work uh, and a pessimism. And Bertrand Russell sort of wonderfully nods to pessimism but ends up an optimist. And when I was studying here, our bet noir was Roger Scruton. And I have a quote from him. But his book is here, which is rather charmingly called The Uses of Pessimism and the Danger of False Hope. And he also points out that actually we have to look the world in the eye if we want to change it. So my icebreaker question to the panel, um, before we hear in depth about their work, was I wanted them to self-analyze how much of an optimist and how much of a pessimist they are out of 100%. Where is their, where is their, kind of, where is their line? And I'm going I'm to go to, to Khan first. Khan, how do you see yourself? Uh, I mean, 40% of me is profound frustration and rage. Um, <laughs> Uh, and real rage that I actually sometimes have trouble containing and my colleagues sometimes end meetings by telling me I've gone too far. But I think 60% has to be optimistic, otherwise you wouldn't keep going. That is so surprising. <laughs> <laughs> I am an optimist. Uh, my mother called me a congenital optimist. <laughs> but I would say I'm 80% optimist, 20% realist, and 0% triumphalist. So you've you've renamed the pessimism and their realism because you just didn't, you couldn't even couldn't even sit with the pessimist label at all. You were like, yeah, can't I call that realism? You can call it realism. Um, I am ninety-seven percent optimist, mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, I t and uh, the other three percent sees opportunity. Um, <laughs> Good one. Uh, I think it depends what day you get me on. Um, so it varies, but basically, I believe that change is possible. So numbers. I don't do them. I want no, numbers. I can't put a number on that. If, anyone, if, anyone, if anyone needs a lawyer, by the way, <laughs> it, it, this corner is stuffed with them, but we need accountants now. We need numbers. <laughs> it depends on the day. It depends on what's going on. It's, it's an infinite variable. Slippery. <laughs> Slippery. Hard to pin down. <laughs> Okay, the ice, the ice is officially broken. I declare the ice broken. Um, I do have a few uh, housekeeping things, which I'm just going to quickly uh, run through now. Uh, remember that your cell phones, we love them being on so that you can, you can tweet um, or text your friends, take photos of us, uh, take <laughs> selfies of yourself with us in the background, um, but make sure that they're on silent. Um, if you are tweeting, then it's very helpful if you use the hashtag. Does everyone know the hashtag? Come on, class. Skull, WF. Hash, yeah, very good. Uh, we will do some uh, Q&A uh, later on. When I do, please wait for the microphone because it's being filmed. Um, and on that note, I should say that we are being live streamed. So the jesticle joke has gone out. <laughs> um, it's, gone, it's gone global. Uh, already. Um, and if you are using the World School World Forum uh, <coughs> mobile app, they would like you to check in. So please check in. OK, I think we've done the housekeeping. Um, so now I want us to spend five or seven minutes really understanding the work of each of these extraordinary people. And obviously we're going to keep coming back to these big theme ideas um, about how change happens, how important it is to conjure different uh, creative futures, not just analyze problems, but to point people to ways that things could be different. I want to know from the social entrepreneurs how important these kinds of communications, um, and film in particular, are in their work. How much does it matter to them to try and reach broader audiences and change people's hearts and minds outside the kind of corridors of power in which they walk? And for the filmmakers, you know, I'm really interested in how they see the intersection of their work and, and social change. And I'm going to start um, first with um, with Pamela, with Pam, um, who. If anyone came to the film um, Disruption last night, they'll know from both seeing the film and, and seeing how incredibly articulately she talks about the way she works with her film, that she really is someone with a very, very deep background in this meeting point of, uh, of social change and film. So, um, 
Pam, I don't know whether you, w whether you want to start with a bit of background in yourself, whether you just want to jump in with some of your um, ideas about the importance of, of um, film and movement building, and then come around to talking about Disruption, your, your new film. And we can see a little bit of it, I think, for those that didn't see it last night. Sure, sure. And I was going to show a clip, too. Can I roll that into the Absolutely, talk? yeah. OK. Um, <coughs> Pamela Yates. I am a partner in Skylight Pictures, which is a New York-based media production company. We specialize in films and advanced digital media about human rights and the quest for justice. But I was born and raised in the Appalachian Mountains of Pennsylvania. It's a very poor coal mining region of the United States. But my town was very rich because it was an Irish American enclave where there were great storytellers. So even though economically we didn't have very much, we entertained each other all the time with um, the stories of the heroic miners and we laughed a lot about the evil mine owners. And I think that was really what inspired me to become a cinematic storyteller. Of course, with cinema, we have so many more tools mm -hmm. to go out into the world, to compress time and space, to really use the power of cinema, of image and sound and music um, and visuals to express the kind of deep emotion. And what we do, I think, at cinematic storytelling with this big multifaceted palette is that we develop a narrative arc with people, incredible personal stories, but we also develop ideas across this arc so that by the end of the film, you have a much greater understanding, you have a much greater emotional uh, attachment, you have much more empathy, and it makes you think more deeply and hopefully act in whatever way you can. The Mayans have a concept called granito de arena, tiny grain of sand. What is my tiny grain of sand that I can contribute to positive social change? And although um, we, and I say we because one of my partners, Paco Deonis, is here. He's the producer of our films. And Peter Canoy, who's another super important partner central to the conception of these films. Um, we have really been fortunate to have come of age cinematically in parallel with the growth of the human rights movement worldwide. So that movement has really inspired the kinds of stories we've told. It ha the people in that movement are the protagonists in our film. And we like to think that our films will help grow this movement. But with disruption, we actually decided to tell a different kind of human rights story. Um, it's a human rights story that has to do with the centrality of economic human rights for women. Because in spite of all the wars that we've covered, and all of the human rights violations that we've exposed, the truth commissions that um, we've told stories about as allegories, we realized that at the base of all of this was incredible inequality, um, poverty in a world plus flush with riches. So what if we were to tell a story that would imagine a different world, a world where women were actually the engines of social change? And that was a story we set out to tell in Disruption. It's been um, very controversial for many people who expected a certain kind of film for, for us, but I have to say I'm really glad that we told this story, um, which was inspired in many ways by participating in the Sundance School Stories of Change workshops over the years. So I'd like to show you um, a short clip, a four minute clip from uh, Disruption. And, and is it worth saying that um, some of the film is based on the work of Fondation Capital, who are of course, you know. I was gonna set that up for you. Uh, okay. But I'll, thank you. I'll just. <laughs> She's a pro. I, I asked Jess to prompt me because I'm a little jet lagged. Thank you. <laughs> oh, it's a, this is a four minute clip that we're going to show. And I, I was trying to decide whether to show um, an emotional clip or an idea clip. But I went with the idea clip because we're in an idea place. Um, this is the, the film disruption is based on the work, the innovation of Fundacion Capital. And the clip that I'm going to show you is a clip about how the women who first were recipients of conditional cash transfers, and then on top of that, learned how to asset build by saving a portion of their conditional cash transfers, and then decided that even better than doing that individually, let's come together and form a recycling cooperative. But even that wasn't enough. They then realized that they actually had to take and have political power in order to solidify their economic gains. So this is a scene where they're talking about trying to go, go that next step to taking political power.
De nada sirve tener el ahorro, de nada sirve invertir cuando alrededor tuyo hay condiciones Exacto. que no te favorecen para crecer como persona y como familia. ¿Qué va a pasar? ¿Una masa de mujeres tomando decisiones cambiará el mundo? ¿Cómo han estado? Ahí creo que es, comienza el rol político de las mujeres. Al conocer a las demás y al conocer también cómo transformar su propia familia, comienzan a ver que su comunidad tiene necesidades y por lo tanto ellas deben representarlas. Así que entre todas nos propusimos a poner en marcha una escuela política. ¿Tu comunidad cómo te ve ahora que participaste en una escuela política? ¿Eres diferente? Eh... Muy diferente totalmente y la comunidad me sigue. Eh, creen, creen ciegamente en mí y yo también le estoy enseñando a ellos todo lo aprendido. Aprovechamos que está Odalis, ¿verdad? Es hija de Inés, de la cooperativa. ¿Y tú qué ves en la cooperativa? Uh, hacen... Hacen como... hacen como una unión en la comunidad de cada barrio. Dile duro, está bien, eso está bien, dile duro. Y también ayudar a todas las comunidades con, por, porque ellas asistieron a, a, capacitación. a las capacitaciones, ellas pudieron aprender sobre la política y poder ayudar a su ciudad y a su barrio. Entonces estamos viviendo en un gobierno que como que a veces no, no, no están de acuerdo con, con, el, con, lo, con las cosas que dice el pueblo. O sea, después no, están, no se ponen de acuerdo con lo que quiere el pueblo, sino nada más con lo que quieren ellos a sí mismos. Ya somos diferentes, ya no, no... O sea, ya somos iguales en cuanto a decisiones y en cuanto a todas esas cosas, ya somos iguales. A derecho y a todo, ¿entiendes? Mujeres capacitadas, líderes, lideresas. ¿Y esto para dónde va? O sé sea, ¿qué tenemos que hacer nosotras como mujeres que ya estamos empoderadas? Tenemos que escoger unirnos y formar una ley de política a nosotras mismas. Surgir el poderismo para que nosotras como mujeres salgamos adelante, porque si no, toda la vida vamos a estar aplastados. Prácticamente es eso. Así que cambios trascendentales deben empezar desde abajo. Y se debe promover en, en los países que esto suceda. Eso a mí me gustaría un, una, una formación política de las personas para que puedan llegar al poder. Estoy convencida de que esa es la única forma de cambiar las cosas. Gracias. Um, ¿Puedes traer up the Rebecca Solnit quote? I chose this quote from my pile of books um, to go with, um, with Pam's. If people haven't discovered Rebecca Solnit yet, I only found her myself about a year ago. She's amazing. But yeah, from the places you have been instructed to ignore or rendered unable to see come the stories that change the world. And it is here that culture has the power to shape, shape politics and ordinary people have the power to change the world. When we talked on the phone, I, 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 have, a quote from, I have a quote from Pam Yates now, um, <laughs> where you said, it's not enough to denounce and expose. We have to help people imagine another way Story and storytelling allow us to create our own history from our own point of view. Uh, I feel like you've been sort of way ahead of us in understanding this, that actually change needs to come bottom up and that often is cultural work. Do you feel like the world is catching up with you on that idea now? I feel like it's becoming such a welcome trend in documentary filmmaking that we um, imagine our films helping to create this world and then finding partnerships to do that that we make the feature-length films as flagships, but then we can create a whole media ecosystem working with our outreach and engagement partners to make the films go even further. I mean, first and foremost, you have to tell a great story. Mm -hmm. 
But beyond that, there are so many other things that we can imagine as filmmakers, and I'm sure you can imagine as social entrepreneurs in terms of partnerships. It's a super creative and fertile field. Great, thank you. Um, I see we have Stefan Chambers with us, who did an amazing job as Master of Ceremonies last night. I salute you. I tweeted about you, but I don't think you're on Twitter, are you? No. Well, you have to. I'll print it out for you and send, send it over. Um, um, let's introduce one of our social entrepreneurs, Charmian from Global Witness. Welcome to the panel. I've got a, um, a slide for you on a, on a quote that you gave me when we were chatting on the phone in pre-preparation. You said you were, you were a big fan of this particular Andy Warhol quote, which, um, I'm sorry, they're just mixing, the mixing. There we go. They always say time changes things, but you actually have to change them yourself, <laughs> um, which is very good. A true, said by a true, <laughs> sorry? The anti-Marx. Yeah, the anti-Marx, <laughs> true, exactly. We, exactly, we are the engine of history. Yeah. Um, and I, I wanted to couple that with a Naomi Klein quote, which I took from, if people, again, if people haven't read This Changes Everything yet, you're so missing out, it's such a great read. Um, but again, here, she's sort of really amplifying this idea and saying, we think that these things become crises and get solved, but actually they become crises that to be solved because we, because we make them so, because we create civil society movements. So Global Witness, you're really building a, a global movement against corruption. Do you want to just sort of speak to the organization and kudos in co-founding it, et cetera? Uh, well, um, uh, thank you. Um, and I, th I think that Andy Warhol quote is for me, it's really, really powerful. And you, know, you asked earlier about optimist or pessimist. That, that for me, is that's quotes kind of says it really. You just got to get out there and do it. Um, so Global Witness, uh, set up by myself, my colleague Simon Taylor, who's here, and uh, another person who might not be here. Oh, here he is, Patrick, all keeping an eye on me. Um, <laughs> over 20 years ago. And we set up because we f saw the interconnection between things at a time when there were fantastic human rights groups and fantastic environment groups, but there were these two parallel tracks. And we kept seeing the bit in between. And um, our first work was kind of a, an example, really, of everything that we've done since, which was looking at how the um, Khmer Rouge were using uh, illegal log exports to fund their part in the civil war. And so for us, this was human rights, it was environment, it was corruption, and it was war and resources. And we've never been able to get it down to anything shorter than that. So for us, it's, it re <laughs> it's really about interconnections and that, and that nexus. Um, and again, in, in that, that, um, that campaign was really all about, uh, the three of us went undercover, we used secret cameras, um, buttonhole, you know, spy hole cameras, <laughs> pinhole cameras, and posed as timber buyers, collecting the evidence that we felt would prove the case study and, and then use that to um, embarrass the hell out of everybody involved, change some legislation in America, make it a public issue, and we managed to get the Thai-Cambodia border closed, um, which had um, was a, a part of, of the end of that, of that conflict, and of course there were many other parts to it. And I think over the years, as we look at, we've looked at other issues like blood diamonds and the, the issues around corruption and the, the need for revenue transparency to stop the looting out of entire countries of their resources. Um, and we've used case studies as a way to prove the issue and to try and create the issue. So we have a bit of a track record for, um, for bringing up issues that other people say, wow, you're really crazy, that's really naive you know, diamonds funding war, don't be silly, dear lady, that's little girl, that's, that's how, well, not so little actually, but anyway, um, that's, you know, that's how, that's how business works. Um, ending anonymous companies, don't be crazy, that's how business works. Uh, revenue transparency, getting companies to publish the payments they make to governments in the countries that they pay, totally crazy, naive idea. Now, about 15 years on, it's, it's law in America, despite all the um, oil companies and the American Petroleum Institute fighting back, it's law across the whole of Europe, that's 500 million people, and it's extending globally. So it's about trying to create change and trying to use the, the case studies um, for that change. Um, so a couple of examples um, would be the, the way that we use case studies, we've, we've talked about reports and increasingly um, uh, we, we still do the reports, but um, we also increasingly moving into film. And I'd, I'd like to show in a, in a, a second um, a short piece of film, about one minute, 20 seconds, of an undercover investigation we did in Sarawak. Now Sarawak has had um, one family basically in control for 30 years. Uh, Chief Minister Taib, who's now um, gone sideways to become governor after the recent elections. And in that time, 30 years, um, 
the family have basically controlled anything to do with land deals. In that time, about 95% of the forests have been destroyed. Um, a lot of, uh, a, a of rumours that around 10% of those deals go to the family. And what we found was that everybody talked about corruption there. Everyone knew about it, everyone talked about it, no one could prove it. So we sent in an undercover investigator who posed as a businessman uh, trying to buy some land. And this little bit coming up um, is an example of, of what happened. And I'll talk a bit more after it. Taib's inner circle repeatedly expressed a sense of personal entitlement to Sarawak's land and resources and showed contempt for its indigenous people. What we had was a state land, okay? Even though it's a state land, any land in Malaysia, the minute, you know, the, the, they're pretty naughty people, the minute they hear land, pretty. naughty people, oh, okay. Okay? Yeah. they try to make money. So the minute they hear, they have people in land and survey department who would tell them, look, you know, this, this land has been given, has been titled to this company to do all palm and whatnot, they'll pong themselves there. Technically, they cannot claim at all but they could make life difficult if you don't accommodate them. They may, you know, like... They, they may harass you, that's yes, all. Yes, that's all. They are actually worry. squatters on the land because their land doesn't belong to them. It's a government land. So there's squatting. Now that you've been out, you know, like in the exterior hall, you know, they're very, very poor. And when leaders come, they look at leaders like they're kings. And they always expect some handouts and things like that, you know? And, you know, I'm not making any excuses or whatever, but, you know, I mean, if you look at the good that he's done for the state, yeah. it outweighs the, all the things that people have said about him. I know people are talking about him being corrupted and all, but I think who, who isn't in this world well, when they're leaders? <laughs> so she um, and the other lady were cousins of, of the chief minister, and they went on to talk about how to structure a deal. Um, by the way, the people are obviously not squatters on the land, it need, perhaps it doesn't need saying. So they went on to talk about how to structure the deal, how to set up anonymous companies, how to use offshore tax structures to make sure no tax got paid. So it was a kind of corruption environment, human rights, there it all is. And you stuck that on YouTube? Are we, well, it, it, that is a short section of about a 16 minute piece, um, and we put that on YouTube. Um, and just put it out there. And it got about 1.3 million hits, which for us was, was amazing. That doesn't usually happen with our stuff. And um, it kind of went viral across Malaysia and it became the, the kind of hot topic of debate because it was the first time that these, in, these this sort of power structure had been exposed for what it was and there was proof out there. It was, there was a time, it was around the time of the election. Um, since then, the chief minister has moved sideways. There is, um, the, the, the Prime Minister was put under you know, public questioning, there were corruption commissions uh, were, were raised around it. Um, is there going to be long-term change? Uh, not as a result of one 16-minute piece of film and investigation. Um, there is a new Chief Minister, he is making sounds and talking about cl um, cracking down on illegal logging. It's way too early to tell whether he means it and whether he has the power base to achieve it. But seeing what happened, and you know, we heard stories anecdotally of people um, making videos of this, translating it into various languages, kayaking it, kayaking it up rivers, taking it out to communities. Um, and I think so that, that you talked about an echo chamber, Pamela. I think that's something that we saw the sort of the power when, when we get it right. And we are, um, you know, with the help of Skull and Sundance, um, moving into telling our stories in a different way and using film. Because I think to date, we've told very complex, policy-heavy advocacy stories. And I think we're, you know, we've really realised, as a result of becoming part of the sort of Skoll community and, and, and working with Sundance, that, we, we, um, that we, we need to do it differently, which is pretty thrilling. Um, yeah. yeah, when we spoke on the, on the phone, um, I was curious, because clearly sometimes you're looking at doing top-down influencing, where actually you know, you're bringing evidence, you're bringing court cases, you, know, you kind of are able to use the existing structures to create the change that you want. And other times you are engaged in a public en engagement movement. Um, and actually it's only by bringing that public pressure that you'll be able to do that kind of top-down job in the first place. And you, you said to me, we are desperate to tell more accessible stories more often. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could speak to how you worked with an independent film team, um, Virunga, where, you know, where actually people came to you and said, we're working on this and we need your kind of expertise. Right. Um, yeah, that was amazing. And for anyone who hasn't seen the Virunga film, um, I urge you to watch it. It's, it's incredibly powerful. And if you want to know about um, 
war and resources and pressure on land and people and some very brave people trying to fight back against it and do something incredible. Please watch that film. It was a, a no, um, Oscar nominated. Um, I think it should have won. People, have people yeah. seen it? Yeah. Have heard who's, of it? Who's seen it? Has everyone seen okay. it? Oh. No. no. Good on, ne good on yeah. Netflix. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's great. We've, um, should, we, should we play the trailer? Because yes. that, will, that will cover a lot of like, what's in it. And then yes. maybe you can speak to, I'm curious, like, how you worked with the film yeah. team, how they approached you. Le parc national de Virunga, c'est la vie de la communauté. C'est dans cette entité là où vous pouvez encore trouver les gorilles des montagnes. C'est ça ma vie. Nous avons l'amour. I think that we have a problem. Companies are exploring for oil. I came here to cover the security situation. I was sworn in to ensure that Virunga National Parks protected and oil companies I have a reputation for controversial ventures. All their efforts are focused on the national park. In the past, it has brought a lot of violence here. Everyone wants their slice of the cake. This isn't a war yet, but it could be soon. Companies are playing with fire. Fear has driven people out of these villages. If we leave, we would lose everything. The national park is the only hope this region has. You must justify why you are on this earth. <laughs> Finalement, nous serons aussi jugés. Nous allons seulement croiser le bras quand le parc sera en train de disparaître. Pourtant, notre souhait est que ce parc reste immortel. Powerful, uh, it's a very powerful documentary. Um, well, we we um, we've been working. Global Witness has been working on um, resources and corruption and its role in funding conflict in Congo for about nearly 15 years. And um, so the the filmmakers approached us. So that's Orlando and Joanna and a few other people involved, and um, asked if we would get involved in looking at doing some of the research around the company. It's a, a UK um, company called Soco. And so they had, and you, you saw a journalist in the film, um, who she had just done this amazing undercover investigation, incredibly brave, and had really documented a lot of what was going on. Um, so you know, the documentary is, is all them. It's, it's absolutely, it's not Global Witness, but we helped to um, get into the detail of some of the, the you know, the, the deals, what was going on, the corporate structures, and were able to put together a report called um, Dwellers in the Mist, which we put out last year, um, yeah, we always do a slightly dodgy pun in our report names, um, and um, and and the sort of the, I think it, the two of that work really strongly. We've been putting pressure under uh, on on the oil company and also um, doing work advocacy work to to protect the park in in um, Congo itself. It, it's the first national park uh, in Africa. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So if you can't protect a UNESCO World Heritage Site, um, what can you protect? And it, it really is, it's on the front line of this increased competition for, for natural resources. Um, and and it's, it's, a, it's a kind of uh, really important um, standard bearer for this issue. And I think to see what way it's going to go is really worrying. There's a lot of work being done uh, with the oil company and the government who, um, you know, there's discussions about trying to change the borders of the national park. Um, the, there are various, various interesting people turned up at the UNESCO World Heritage uh, meeting um, last year, so we're kind of trying to keep track of that. Um, and it, it's really worrying. And you know, the, the company were doing seismic testing, 
And they then sort of said, okay, well, we're stopping, we're stopping, we're stopping. Well, they were going to stop anyway. Um, so they, and they've said they may, that, you know, they, that they're not going to drill, but that's not really deemed particularly credible. And they may well just flip their contract onto somebody else. So I think well, Actually, Roger, Roger Cahill, the, the um, deputy um, CEO, just said quite candidly to the Times, didn't he, when they asked him the question, he said, we were going to stop drilling anyway because we finished our testing. It takes us a year to analyse the results. Yeah. And then he said, and then it's up to the Congolese government whether they'd like to declassify the park and we can come back. Yep. So it that's, was, yeah, that's, that, there's yeah no literally, strategy. they just, yeah. And unfortunately, um, no, what the... <laughs> no, well... Yeah, I have He's an optimist. Roger Cahill's <laughs> an optimist about Psycho International's yeah. chances and, and, of and drilling and in for Anga National Park. And they, they, you know, they really shouldn't have been drilling there. Um, the Worldwide Fund for Nature were, were going to um, um, put an OEC, a complaint into the OECD about this, um, and they've now put that complaint on hold, which is really hard to understand why they're not moving ahead with that. It's a real shame they haven't pushed ahead with that. So there's some form of kind of accountability around this. Well, we're really keen to see more partnerships like this where you know, the filmmakers do their job mm. and the kind of like the experts on the you know, kind of transparency and legal and political side of it do their job and come together. And sorry, can we just have the, the report up again? I just as well was really struck by how witty this was. Um, so I just, I just commend you because sometimes, um, you know, sometimes we think of our um, NGO partners as sort of doing these really dry reports when we're doing the, w the really exciting films. And actually, this is one of those moments where I laughed and laughed when I read this. You can't see it because the writing's too small, but at the bottom in the sort of billing block that you'd normally see on a movie, it sort of th says things like, you know, featuring fear and violence um, and things like that. It's, yeah, it's really witty. Oh, thank you. But yeah. Great, okay. fantastic work. Yeah. Khan, the independent diplomat. Um, is it true that you're related to Robert the Bruce? Yes. Can we have the slide, please? <laughs> 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 but so are about, uh, literally about 200 million people are related to Robert the Bruce. I found, it, I found it on your grandfather's Wikipedia entry, so I felt I'd done a yeah. little bit of sleuthing, although you did. not, yeah, yeah, I hadn't really, but just huh. for, um, for those who've joined us from all over the world, um, the thing about Robert the Bruce made so much sense of you um, when I found this out is, of course, that you defeated, you know, the, the English, uh, you know, who the English occupiers were, were sort of given a right routing uh, at the Battle of Bannockburn in 1314 by... Um, Khan's illustrious uh, <laughs> <laughs> relative. Um, and of course, probably myth, you know, it's probably myth, the kind of try, try, try and again story, but <laughs> the legend that all school children learn is that he had to hide in a cave at one point and watched a spider trying to make a web and failing and trying to make a web and failing and then succeeding and then kind of came out of the cave and rallied the troops and said, you know, try, try, try again until we succeed and then defeated the English at Bannockburn. So uh, it all makes sense to me now of your, of your story. I, I, <laughs> you're now thinking, how the hell do I talk about what I do through that lens? I know, it's a bit, was, a, was, a bit of a cur was a bit of a curveball, I apologize. So um, you want me now. to talk now? Yeah, yeah, you're on now. <laughs> oh my god, um, what about? Uh, <laughs> well, just if you can just um, explain your, kind of your journey to this, to this point, um, okay. what Independent Diplomat uh, does. You guys became Skull Grantees uh, last year, and I was was it last year or the year, year before? before? Year yeah. before, yeah. that's right. Yeah. And um, I was applauding away at the ceremony because the work that you do is extraordinary. Um, sticking up for the little guy and giving representation to um, peoples who don't yet have statehood. But if you can kind of explain just oh, quickly. Not, not only those, those with states. Those as well. with states. Little okay. states, yeah. poor states. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm somewhat distressed that not only am I the most pessimistic panelist, <laughs> but I'm also one without a movie. Um, <laughs> and, uh, Maybe that's the problem. You've got some stills there. <laughs> Um, but, um, I mean, in a sense, that reflects the rather sort of dark and closed nature of what we do in Independent Diplomat, which is dealing with diplomacy, which is a, a very closed practice um, and remains so. Um, and how it began is that I was a British diplomat for many years, um, and I thought I always would remain a British diplomat. I wanted to be an ambassador, Sir Khan Ross, with my... Uh, Rolls-Royce, and um, another thing my grandfather did was write Noblesse Oblige, the book with Nancy Mitford, hence the desire to belong to the upper classes. I'm going to um, tuck that away for the next time you're on a panel of mine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, anyway, that's what I wanted to do, what my parents wanted me to do, um, and I thought I was going to do until after various postings around the world, I ended up working on Iraq. Um, 
and weapons inspections. Um, I, I was Britain's Iraq and Middle East expert at the UN Security Council. I worked on Israel, Palestine, the Western Sahara, um, uh, uh, Libya, and Iraq was my main job. And I um, set up the weapons inspection body, Ammavik. I was our liaison with the weapons inspectors. I was the, one of the two direct diplomatic links with the Saddam government. Um, and it was an amazing job, really, really interesting, um, very dramatic. I was involved in several conflicts um, um, and had been in several wars, involved in several wars throughout my life. Um, and anyway, I mean, the mention of Iraq no doubt gives a hint as to why I'm no longer a British diplomat because in 2004, I gave what was then secret evidence to the first official inquiry into the war, um, the Butler Inquiry. And uh, I thought by keeping it secret, I could keep my career and um, have my say about the lies and the fact that they'd ignored alternative to, to war and had uh, transgressed the very resolutions that I myself had helped negotiate. Um, uh, so that wasn't exactly a heroic act, far from it. It was rather cowardly. Um, but when I sent in the evidence, I realized I couldn't actually do both things. I couldn't keep my career as a diplomat and um, try to um, say what I thought about the war. So I had to resign, and I didn't know what to do at that point. But I was living in Kosovo. I'd been seconded to the United Nations in Kosovo. And Kosovo, um, through actual political violence, gave me an idea, or rather gave my wife an idea, who should take the credit for it. Um, uh, a, a more brilliant political mind than me. And uh, um, what happened was that Kosovo was uh, of indeterminate status and the world had not decided what should happen to Kosovo, whether it should be a state or not. And this caused immense political frustration and that broke out into violence in 2004. And I began to see the connection between uh, political marginalization and political violence because Kosovo was denied access to the diplomatic discussion about Kosovo's future. It was literally legally prohibited from having a diplomatic service, from having ambassadors, from having a foreign ministry. And yet uh, the UN Security Council, uh, this small group of countries called the Contact Group, was where the future of Kosovo was being determined. And so you saw this immense disconnect. And um, I, you know, for want really of anything better to do and wanting to stay in diplomacy, but not really being able to work in diplomacy unless you work for a government, um, I started to advise the Kosovo government. I knew the prime minister and, you know, just started directly to advise him. And that was the beginning of what became, sorry, my mouth is drying up. That's coffee. Um, <laughs> it's okay. Um, that was the beginning of what became Independent Diplomat which is this organization 10 years later that's a group of diplomats and international lawyers. And we advise various countries in situations like Kosovo, um, not only those who want to become a state, uh, we advise Somaliland, we advise, we did talk to the Scots. Um, uh, uh, um, I'm not gonna tell my joke about that, that I tell my colleagues. Um, well, go on. Twitter's really bad in these situations. Um, uh, <laughs> And there's various things I want to say that I really would say, because there's so many friends here who I greet, um, who I would tell my friends, but I really don't want to be public. See, see him in the corridor um, with me afterwards. For yeah, that joke. but there are things that people need to think about here, because you know, where I've got to with Independent Diplomat is a place of uh, some conflict for myself. Um, just to finish the story, I mean, we, we now advise various political movements who are in different ways marginalized. We advise the um, the democratic Syrian opposition, the Syrian coalition. We advise the Palestine mission to the UN and through them the PLO in Ramallah. We advise, and this is controversial, the most, I guess, the government of Catalonia. We advise uh, Somaliland, the Marshall Islands. I like the way Islands. you think the Catalonians are controversial. I know, it's more controversial even than the PLO. I mean, it <laughs> seems to get people really, really upset, that one. Um, no, well, yes. Um, anyway, um, uh, <laughs> it's a long story. Um, uh, and one of the groups that I advise, which is kind of one of the sources of personal conflict for me, is the Frente Polisario of the Western Sahara, um, which is occupied by Morocco illegally. It has been for uh, 40 years now. An immensely difficult diplomatic issue, which I'm immensely concerned about now um, for various complex reasons. 
Um, and is one of the reasons 40% of me is despairing because uh, you know, the people of the Western Sahara were driven out by Moroccan troops in 1975. And they live in refugee camps, in, literally in the middle of the Sahara Desert, it's sort of figurative as well as literal um, symbolism of isolation and diplomatic marginalization. And in a sense, the heart of what independent diplomat does today. Um, and I, I'm slightly hysterical because I had so little sleep last night. But I guess where I'm going with this is that I think part of me is increasingly worried by what NGOs are and this discourse of NGOs and social entrepreneurship that renders technical what is in fact profoundly political. And my life has been a journey of political radicalization from really believing that nice people like me working in governments, democratic governments, or at least governments I thought were democratic, would run the world to, to the benefit of all the people of the world. And I stopped believing that with the Iraq war, seeing a democratic, allegedly democratic government do you know, betray its people in the gravest of duties. But also, uh, over the years that followed, um, I have begun to realize the frustrations of the politically marginalized and why they are politically marginalized and how the world is set against them and why systems like the world's diplomatic system, you know, on the face of it, places like the UN look like places where justice is delivered, but in fact they're not. Um, they're places where injustice is delivered and that our decisions at the UN Security Council were largely, were all manifestations of great power politics, but were largely unjust. You just have to ask a Palestinian or You're sounding more like Sahawati. 50% to me now. Sorry? <laughs> I think you're 40% sounding more like 50% now. Well, maybe. Um, Mine's growing. I mean, I ask this because these, these are my friends and I'm looking yeah. for answers yeah. um, because I don't know. Talk and I'm looking at Arundhati Roy, who's written a lot about this, mm -hmm. about the NGO industrial complex um, and how actually we are part of something that holds up the status quo because we um, cling to the belief and the claim that we are changing the status quo. Um, and I'll tell you a story which I really would be grateful if people did not tweet this uh, because it's, it's awkward and uh, embarrassing. Um, but the other day I saw, and my colleagues Nick and Sherry were there too, um, we saw this remarkable woman, one of my <coughs> real heroines, um, a woman called um, Aminatu Haidar, who's a human rights activist in the Western Sahara who's been tortured, held in solitary confinement, um, has been uh, separated from her children. The Moroccans have tried to exile her. And I was talking to her about what's going on in the Western Sahara and the growing frustration of people there and the risk of people turning to extremist violence. And I said to her, look, diplomacy is not working. Um, you've got to think of something else. What would that something else would be? And we began to talk about nonviolent revolution and techniques of nonviolence. And I began to think, feel that this is really where my heart was because I was beginning to wonder whether diplomacy really was the place that could deliver justice. And even when people like us are trying to smash through it and break it open in the way that we do. And I went back to my desk and there was an email. We have these wonderful interns who collect stories about the Western Sahara and all of our projects. And the email said that Richard Branson had organized a kite surfing competition in the Western Sahara at the behest of his friend, the King of Morocco. And uh, I was so outraged by this um, and shocked and still, I'm so angry about it because Richard Branson is one of these philanthropists, and Christ, and he's probably here, I don't know. Um, uh, uh, you know, he's one of these people who stands up for Aung San Suu Kyi, I think he was one of the founder of the elders. Um, uh, and we had just submitted a funding application to the Branson Foundation um, for our work on Palestine because we couldn't find anybody to fund our work on Palestine. Funny that in America um, we were told literally by the organization of foundations in America not to even present to them the Palestine project. And to this day we're finding it enormously difficult to get funding and we have a hell of a funding problems because people don't like being associated with our clients. And I have begun to really question the model um, when I see things like that and when I well, see things like... I would say like stop reading Aaron Dutty Roy because that's only going to make it worse because well, her power analysis is depressing, I give it to you. It, it's not, I would say, it's not I would about say emotion, it's no, 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 about no, 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 it's about, no, it's about, it's about um, you know, theories of change. Yeah. But I think, Naomi, for me, Naomi Klein and Rebecca Solnit 
are really talking about now is the time for to go back to movement building. And that actually there was a kind of a period where we thought we could do top-down influencing. We could start these organisations, these NGOs, these influencing organisations, mm. and we could have a seat at the table with the big boys and sort things out at that level. And I think yeah. for both of them, they're saying the realisation is that was a massive kind of strategic error. And what yeah. we need to do is bring the people with us, and we need to b yeah. be building people movements. And that feels like that's what you're saying too. It is what I'm saying. And I, I've Am gone I from a position of believing I'm that so governments yeah. and influencing governments and you know trying to get governments to do the right thing um, is the way forward and although there is merit in that and governments still have armies and air forces and they still really matter in places like Syria um, I now believe that you know mass movements and what well, you know a version of gentle anarchism is the answer to real political change and the transformation of capitalism itself yeah. is a necessary precondition I might give you the Rebecca Solnit's takeaway it's called hope in the darkness and it's beautiful <laughs> And I'm, I I'm a I huge fan of Rebecca. She's one of the. Oh, you've I you've, you've read it already. Read. Damn it! I want to think of something else books. too. She's um, great. And just to bring you back to my sorry to, to boringly bring you back to my theme though, um, could you just speak really quickly for a couple of minutes about um, No Fire Zone? Because I know it's a film that you uh, were very aware of because you were working with the Tamils. Yeah. And actually, that's an example. Uh, uh, it's one maybe one small and all too rare example of where a film uh, sort of did cut through and push the UN in the direction it needed to go? Question mark. Well, I, I'm a big believer in films. Uh, I didn't used to be. Um, I used to be sort of, you know, we in governments kind of knew everything and films were just entertainment for the sort of sentimentalists out there. Um, uh, and actually, my work and my life since has really opened me to the possibility of, of powerful storytelling as a way of transforming things. And that film is one of the reasons I feel that, because No Fire Zone is an extraordinary, very, very upsetting film about war crimes at the end of the war in Sri Lanka, a very powerful film. And that for film has had an extraordinary political impact, actually, in the diplomatic world, um, and has been one of the reasons that people have begun talking, have pushed for accountability for those war crimes in places like the Human Rights Council. Not the only reason, but it's certainly one of the reasons. Uh, David Cameron saw the film and that was one of the reasons he went to the Tamil areas of northern Sri Lanka, which was the first time a major leader of a big government, particularly one associated with the history of Sri Lanka, had been there in many years, um, which was a big deal. And these things, these things matter. Great. Thank you. You do have a film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I think films make a difference. And, I, you know, I was thinking about what films have made a difference in recent weeks, and I was thinking about the films of... Uh, black Americans being shot by cops. I think those films, um, you know, they're not deliberately designed as storytelling films, but I think they are going to make a difference. Though I remembered also Rodney King being beaten on film, and I wondered how long ago was that and where are we today? No, too true. And just so you don't think I didn't have a quote for you, I did. I didn't quite manage to work it in, but I'm just going to stick it up anyway. When we talked on the when we talked on the phone or on Skype, I think, um, you very much were talking about Karl Popper. And I think that very much fits you, because you're, I think, pessimist. Maybe, maybe we'll go with Pam's world. I feel like you're a hardened realist, and that's why Popper really speaks to you, which is a kind of like, don't be fooled by delusions. Really see how it is. Be prepared to say, that doesn't work. That's wrong. Move yeah, again. Find a new that's way. really why Let's keep going. Yeah. That's, yeah. And now I'm going to come to Dawn. And for Dawn, we have Aaron Dutty Roy. But Aaron Dutty Roy in beautiful mode, rather than in kind of speaking truth to power mode. I just think this is a wonderful, wonderful quote, and we just put it in the new Brit Doc um, book, because it's something I feel we want to live up to every day. To seek joy in the saddest places, to pursue beauty to its lair, to never simplify what is complicated or complicate what is simple, to respect strength, never power, above all, to watch, to try and understand, to never look away, and never, never to forget. Dawn, we, in our conversation when we were talking about um, you know, your, your kind of philosophy of filmmaking and Gideon's Army, wonderful film that we uh, had in good pitch and now the new film that you're making. You had this wonderful expression uh, about the power of the quiet story and I felt that's really why I kind of picked that, um, picked that quote for you. So do you want to speak a little bit about the kind of films you make and how it, it's in that philosophy mm -hmm. and then talk into the film that you're making now and then we'd mm -hmm. love to see a bit. Um, so uh, my background is I'm a lawyer. I was a litigator um, for five years at a corporate law firm. Um, and then my best friend died of ovarian cancer. And um, I looked up and I thought, 
is this all I'm going to do with my life? Um, is it enough to be uh, financially secure um, and not that brave? So um, I, I went to the very next thing that interested me that was offered to me um, was a job at ABC Television, ABC News. And I went there first as a lawyer, and then I started doing ethics in journalism. Um, and it just was uh, such a transformative experience. I was in edit rooms, um, but I was seeing every single day um, reading scripts. News pieces have scripts. Um, and we sit in edit rooms. And how you tell a story and what people illustrate that story is incredibly powerful. So uh, one of the projects we did while at ABC um, was to see uh, who were the people being uh, projected as authorities. So why did you not choose a female doctor to give the newest information on a medical breakthrough? Why not choose a black person? Why not choose a Latino person? And through those conversations, um, I learned something. It's you're really simple. It's not always a conspiracy to oppress the marginalized classes. Sometimes uh, producers are busy. And so they needed a very practical solution, and this is where the 3% opportunity happens, is they just needed people of color. And instead of being just angry at them that they hadn't looked, we gave them a list. And slowly you started to see more people um, from different backgrounds. And then they liked it because then their newscasts were diverse. So diverse in that they looked different from the others and then they took credit for being like the most interesting um, newscasts. But um, take your joy where you find it. So, um, so when I, uh, I, I went to A&E Television, um, which is a, a, a cable broadcaster, uh, primarily History Channel, did some work there, and I started to get really frustrated with the sameness and the direction of American media and what was captivating the public. Um, it's such a, a joy to be here because the uh, continual refrain we hear is that Americans are not interested in the world, in international stories. And so seeing Virunga, um, if you were to encapsulate Virunga um, and say to somebody, I'm going to show you a story about Africa where black people are prominently featured about uh, exploration and oil drilling in a national park, you probably wouldn't sell that. But you show them Virunga trailer and your heart is racing um, and you want to see that story. So I think that's what film does. Um, it takes what you think you know and it turns it on its head. Um, and so what I'm very interested in is um, I mean, I'm interested in a lot of things, but what has, has occupied my time most recently is telling you, um, showing stories about things we think we know. Um, and so I spent three and a half years making a film about public defenders, lawyers who are appointed to represent the poor. And even though I was a lawyer, I was never a public defender. Um, and the first time I met them, I was asked to go to Alabama um, in the deep south in America um, history, so very severe racial discrimination, civil rights history. Um, and I went there and I saw all these young lawyers and they were just about to start their careers representing poor people accused of crime. And these were the happiest group of lawyers I had ever seen. <laughs> and they were talking about justice and the Constitution and I burst into tears and I said, I, I, that's what I was supposed to be, um, but I wasn't. So really, um, I didn't set out to make this full-on documentary, I just was like, why are you so happy being a lawyer? <laughs> um, and it was those stories that um, I think connected with people, because they certainly connected with me. Um, so after I did Gideon's Army, um, you know, I think there's always this fear that you're never going to find your second film. <laughs> um, and I had done another film, I did um, a, a history film, but um, this project I'm working on now is um, I feel a very similar way. It's about uh, the abortion clinics in the Deep South that are closing rapidly. Um, and as you think about the problems of the world, um, and we all can get quite siloed in our thoughts about the problems of the world, I hope you will remember America, because we have many problems. And I think that um, our connections uh, can be helpful to one another. Um, so I think I will just show you the trailer. It's a trailer, so it tells a whole story. Um, unless Great. You have a question. The trailer for Trapped. I got a pregnancy test and I called my best friend and I just cried like I'm pregnant. Be encouraged, be encouraged. Don't let it destroy you. 60% of 
of the patients at ICU are below poverty level. If abortion care collapses in Alabama because of the new legislation that's out there, it would be disastrous. In the past three years, there have been over 300 restrictions passed. Texas, Oklahoma, Arizona, North Dakota, Arkansas, Wisconsin, Alabama, Mississippi. You have to be compliant with whatever they're asking us to do. You know, a lot of this doesn't make a lot of sense. How wide your halls are? How many bathrooms you have? The drugs always expire because we never use them. We're looking all total probably at $35,000 worth of work. Every time the legislature meets, there's another restriction. First, we had to have a transfer agreement with the hospital, so we got that. And then they passed the every doctor had to have admitting privileges, and that's the one that we just couldn't meet. We had to actually close down the practice entirely. Those new regulations that are set to reduce Texas to a state where there are only six clinics for the whole state, where there's one reproductive health clinic per every 2.2 million women in the state. It's increasingly becoming the case that women's constitutional rights are determined by their zip codes. There's really no clinics in West Texas anymore at all. If there's no clinic, if there's no doctor, it doesn't matter if abortion is legal or not. Like Roe v. Wade doesn't even matter anymore. We're seeing women self-induce with medications. We're seeing women actually consciously induce violence physically to try to induce a miscarriage. I remember getting a call from a patient. She said, I can't get to San Antonio. So what if I tell you what I have in my kitchen cabinet and you tell me what I could do? Prior to Roe v. Wade, women were willing to risk their lives to terminate a pregnancy. They're still willing to do that. Women have to have access to abortion. I'm Dr. Parker, one of two doctors who flies into Mississippi to provide abortion care for women. There are no doctors in Mississippi who provide care. As you know, it's a very hostile environment. My decision to go there was based on the fact that if nobody else will go, who's going to go? Today you see the first step in a movement, I believe, to do what we campaigned on, to say we're going to try to end abortion in Mississippi. You might try to do so, but you should understand it's not going to happen without a fight. We are going to continue to stand up for women, you know, standing next to each other and fighting for what's right. It is not right that women should have to go to court to get the medical services that the Constitution guarantees them. In the United States right now, there are over three dozen cases on access to abortion services going through the courts. People don't realize, you know, we're going to continue to see these rights lost. Today it felt like somebody moved us back off the edge of a cliff. The Supreme Court is going to hear another one of these cases. It's going to be a showdown. Women should be in the streets on this. The pro-life side has won. We've already won. I just want more people to start asking who's benefiting from this. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Father God, give us peace, God. These and all blessings and blessings in your son, Jesus' name. Amen. I love what you said your, your mother said when you told her what film yeah, you were making. my mother said, oh, first the public defenders who are overworked and overburdened, and now another comedy <laughs> about abortion. <laughs> and I also really loved the thing you said, which was, you know, we have to make room for the quiet voices. The loudest voices are winning. Quiet people stand up. You know, um, so we've been following Dr. Willie Parker, who is the physician you see, um, uh, and what he does, um, you know, the assault on reproductive uh, rights in America has been this two-pronged attack. First, you kill doctors, and so you eliminate people who are willing to risk their lives to do abortion procedures. Um, and then you start to legislate so that there's no, uh, there's no access. So the few who are remaining um, have all these requirements that it's impossible for them to meet. And it's an incredibly effective uh, political organizing strategy. Dr. Parker uh, is the fifth of five children, first in his family, raised in Alabama, first in his family to go to college. He was a, a fundamentalist Christian. He did not do abortions for 12 years. And then he started to see um, black women in particular dying from lack of reproductive health care. And uh, he said, I think Jesus wants me to do health care. And I think abortion is part of health care. And we should be talking about medicine um, rather than morality. Um, let morality stay between people and their God. Um, and his voice, although it is quite insistent, um, is one of those. His voice uh, is shown through his actions. So he flies around the country to these tiny clinics 
um, who have no, would have no doctor otherwise. Mm -hmm. Literally, there is one abortion clinic in the entire state of Mississippi. In five states in America, there is one clinic in the state. So the people that are most impacted are poor women and women of color, and um, that is not a story that's being told. And it, um, you know, I always thought I was pro-choice, but I'd never been in an abortion clinic, and I'd never seen the people actually providing the service. Um, and uh, it's been, um, if I was pro-choice then, I am quite pro-choice now, which has nothing to do with my personal decision making, um, but that's not the point. It's the point about what every person's personal dignity says they get to decide for themselves. Thank you. Jessica. Back, back to me. <laughs> um, I feel like quite a few common themes here about m making something the issue and about the need to kind of communicate, inform, and move and change from bottom up now, a moment for change for bottom up. We have five minutes left. Now the audience are going to vote. You can either have five minutes of questions from the audience or for the next five minutes, I can ask the panel what they know now they wish they'd known 10 years ago. So who'd like to vote for questions from the audience? Okay, everyone wants, who, okay, maybe, hang on, maybe they're asleep. Who'd like, who'd like to vote for hearing the answer to the question, what they know now, they wish they'd known 10 years ago? Oh, they're awake, they really want to know that. Okay, excellent, good, thank you, that's what we'll do. Um, I'm gonna start first with Pam. That is such a mischievous Jess question. <laughs> what would I say to my 10 year younger self? I think, about how they I would, yeah, I would have made the work more effective. Yeah. You're like, oh, I spent 10 years figuring this shit out. If okay. I'd known that, that 10 years ago, I could have just gone for it. Yeah, that whatever we've been able to win, for example, in Roe versus Wade, the right to have an abortion, for example, the fact that the United States um, was one of the drafters of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which completely bans torture, and yet there's torture. So whatever victories we've won, we have to work very hard to keep them, and we have to work very hard to sustain them, and we have to work hard to expand them. A victory is never a victory on its face. Good, I like it, strong. Yeah, Thank you. please. <laughs> Dawn. Um, I would say um, that you shouldn't underestimate yourself. Um, and you can be self-limiting in a number of ways, and one of them is assuming that you can only do what you are already doing. So um, I think one of the things that happens with documentary filmmakers that is probably common to you all is you get obsessed and outraged. And so um, you're willing to take a risk because you don't care if you're embarrassed. Um, and I think that that is something um, that we share. I probably wouldn't, I would care a lot more about being embarrassed in my fancy law firm than I do when I'm making a film because I feel like it's so much more important that it's not about me anymore. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you, please, round of applause. <laughs> like, it's just like, you know, because at the end you get applauded together, you uh, see, okay. but this is like, you <laughs> yes. know what I mean, like, this is like the individual Personal. moment. Charmian. Ooh, it is a tricky question, a tricky jazz question. Um, I think for me, and I think maybe Patrick and Simon might have different answers, um, and other people in the organisation, for me, I think, in fact, I know, I wish that I had better understood the power of more accessible storytelling back then. And I think, gosh, if, we, if, if I had and we had, what more might have been possible? Could we have speeded up some of the campaigns, reached even more people? So f for me, it's great storytelling and film and, and, and you know, the online world is something I wish I'd been much more, um, put a lot more time and energy and, and kind of understanding into. Good. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. give a round of applause. Yeah. And Khan. Um, 10 years ago, was it? You can do 12. Um, or eight. 12. Just that um, sense of kind of... Well, um, I think what I wish I'd known uh, because I want more time and I want more years to do what I do and to <laughs> fight the fight. Um, I wish I'd known then that having status and a job and something, you know, a position in life that people th was secure, that people thought was actually a pretty cool job and that I thought was a pretty cool job and sort of ticked a number of boxes in terms of what one's supposed to do with one's life, the career, money, status, um, 
uh, power even, mm. power, real power, uh, that actually um, it was far more, it is far more fulfilling, far richer, uh, though it's much, much harder and it's much more upsetting, but it is so much richer to be fighting with the side, the other side of the table from where I used to be, with the Sahwaris, with the Polisario Front, with the, um, you know, I think it's so great that I fight for a desert liberation movement who, you know, they sent my children a bouquet of flowers when they were born. And uh, I thought they're probably the only babies in London who, in Britain, who got a bouquet of flowers from a Guevara's liberation movement <laughs> when they were born. And, you know, I'm very proud of it, but it also moves me so much. And I was never moved by my work as a British diplomat. And I wish I'd known that that actually is, you know, the fire that keeps one going. And it's hard not to reach for cliches in describing this because it's actually beyond words. Thank you. Please come around, please. I feel like this this big message about yeah power power to the people god it's like a 1960s back to the sick well like in some ways that's what we're talking about i think can we finish with khan's quote from his book um in my pile of books here is the he hasn't um, made a film yet although i think people are making a film with you currently trying to wanting to um but Khan is also the, yeah, he's the accidental anarchist, that's the film title, but he's also the author of this fantastic book, which is in my pile here, so please come and have a look, The Leaderless Revolution, which, again, I think is very much along our theme today, um, which is, yeah, how do, we, how, do we, how do we grow power at the bottom, rather than just try and pull the levers at the top. Um, so, just to, to conclude, thanks so much to, to Tabitha at Sundance for inviting me to be the moderator. Where's Sandy Hertz from Skull for um, inviting us all to be here? Thank you. And um, to my legal warrior, my quiet storyteller, my story movement builder, and my true public servant, please give them a huge <laughs> round of applause.